Hi, I'm Stacy, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. And today we're going to be flashing some LEDs. So we're all ready to go. So let's make a project. So I'm going to go file new project. Next, and we're going to put in LED flash. There we go. Next, I want an RTL project. Thank you. I want to create a file and I want to choose its location and I want to put it in the LED flash folder and make a new folder called source. Okay, select and I'm going to call it LED flash.sv. Go. So I think that's going to be my only source file. My language is Verilog. Next, add files. I'm going to copy an XDC file. Copy. What board is this? This is in Nexus A7 100T2 LED flash uh, XDC. It's going to fail. So I'm going to make dir. And then I can do that. Okay, so now I can go and choose my constraints. And then next family, I'm going to find my board. So this is where those board files that we copied are now available. So I'm going to choose my board, uh, boards, vendor, digilant, and it's a Nexus A700 T. It's that guy, next. So when I choose the board, now it knows what FPGA is on the board and all the details of the FPGA. Yes, it's asking me if it can close the programmer and I'm saying yes to that. Okay, so now it's making my project. Okay, so now I can choose what my inputs and outputs are gonna be. So I'm gonna choose input clock and it's gonna be a input reset. And then I'm gonna make an output that's my LED. There we go. Next. Okay, now we have everything set up. So here's my top level module and we can put stuff in it. And now I need to take a look at the constraints because I want to see what we're working with here. So we have a hundred meg clock. So I'm just going to uncomment, delete that guy, delete that guy. There's our LED. So we can pick that LED. If you don't know what these constraints are and you don't know where your LEDs are, they, the timing constraints video will show you how to make these constraints, where to find this information, where to find the pins for the LEDs on your board, all of that stuff. So if you don't know what this is, go see that video. Buttons, CPU reset in. Why is it called a CPU reset if there's no CPU? Okay. So these names, get ports, need to correspond with my top level module. And my top level module has clock here. So I'm going to just copy that and make this one called clock. And then copy that and make this one called reset in and because it's a active low reset i'm going to put underscore in and that means that it's an active low reset and then led led so now my constraints are all set up and now i've also connected up my leds and my clock and my reset with the top level of my module so when it gets synthesized it knows what top level corresponds with what pin okay now i need to make a flash well what are we going to do so I have to first decide how quickly it's going to flash. So we do 500, no, 5,000, no, 1,000. So it's a second on, a second off. Now, how do I convert this into clock cycles? Well, let's do my clock rate. My clock rate parameter clock rate is 100, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we have the clock rate, which is cycles per second. We have the flash rate, which is in milliseconds. So in order to convert the clock rate into milliseconds, we decide divide by a thousand and then the milliseconds cancel out. And we make it off. We've got to be on for so many cycles and then off for so many cycles. Now we need a counter. Flash counter. I've got a flash counter. So now my counter needs to count up. Okay, so now we have our if statement. Why is this complaining about the syntax? If it complains about the syntax, uh, one of the things to check is the set file type, and we choose system Verilog. Now it's happy with it. Weird. So it just was trying to pass it as a Verilog file, and it's actually a system Verilog file. Okay. So if I'm in reset, then my counter is driven by all zeros. If I'm not in reset, I need to keep track of whether I'm counting up or counting down. So I'm going to do logic on not off flag. So this indicates whether it, I'm on or off and then that gets driven by a zero which means that I'm off. So now we do the counting. So I'm counting up 
to the on number if I'm flagged as on, and I'm counting up to the off number if I'm flagged as off. So now I'm on, which means I'm counting up to the on counter. Slash counter is less than rate minus one, begin, end, else, begin, end. And then I'm going to copy and paste that into this section and make this the off. So then this is, if I'm on, then it's this one. If I'm off, then it's this one. If I'm less, then flash counter is driven by flash counter plus one. And in this case, the flash counter is driven by flash counter plus one. So what you could do, I'm duplicating code with this. You can combine this into one big if statement, but I'm not going to do it like that today. I don't feel like it. So if I haven't reached it, then I just carry on counting. If I have reached it, then I'm driven by zero and the flag is driven by not the flag. So that just means that I flip the flag over and I can put that case there. So you, there is a bit of code, code duplication in this in that you can order the if statements around a little bit better, but I'm this is clear enough for me laying out which combination of cases. And that's it. So now all I do is I say, a sign LED is driven by or not off. So the only thing that I need to check is I need to check if my LED is active high or active low. The LED that I'm using is pin number H17. So we're going to head over to reference manual, basic IO. Okay, here we go. LEDs are pulled down. So they're active high. So these are active high LEDs. Um, which means that when I drive on, not off, it'll be on. So that's the right way around. Say, okay, before I put this in hardware, I'm going to simulate it. Create simulation sources, create file, and it's going to be a system Verilog file. And I'm going to choose the location and I'm going to add a folder and it's going to be called test bench. Select and it's going to be LED flash tb.sv. Okay, finish. It's got no ports because it's a test bench. Yes, thank you. So then I go to my simulation sources. I'm just going to hijack some from previous test bench of mine. Clock period. Uh, this counter is in nanoseconds. That's in nanoseconds. 10 nanoseconds will get you a 100 meg clock. There's my clock and there's my reset. I don't need the output pin to be connected up to anything. Okay, let's run simulation and drink some coffee. So I'm just going to drag my LED flash module. It should be a second on 12 milli. Wait, I'm confused. Okay. Well, it's on and off and on and off. I'm just curious as to why it's running so much quicker. What's my clock period? It is 10 nanoseconds. So why is it one two one seven five uh, one two one five? Why is this value so wrong? One two one five seven five two. That's a really weird number. Since all of these are zero. <laughs> oh, you know what? This is more than thirty two bits, and by default the parameters are thirty two bit integers. So if I specify sixty three down to zero, let's see if that helps. Because I think that by default parameters are thirty two bits. And I think that that might be the reason why I'm running into trouble. So let's just rerun this. There we go. Okay, so now these values are correct. So now it's going to count up forever. It's actually going to take really, really long because I'm running for, I have to run it for a second. So I'm going to just reduce these by like this. So now it should be up for 10 milliseconds and down for 10 milliseconds. There we go. So now on the 10 millisecond mark, it's switched direction. Okay, so I'm going to change this back to what it was, and then I'm going to set this as the top level, which it is, and I'm going to synthesize this. So now it's running synthesis. It should be pretty quick because it's a really small synthesized design. Ooh, synthesis failed. Ooh. Oh, does it have to be neg edge? Didn't think about that. Here we go. It's got to be a neg edge because it's active low. So you want to trigger on the down edge. So when it's zero, it will be right after a down edge. So that's why. 
That's why I complained about that. This is called an asynchronous reset. It's when the reset signal is included in the sensitivity list. This is this is the sensitivity list. And the reset signal is included in it. And that means that this these signals are driven on the reset down edge or the reset falling edge, no matter what the status of the clock is. And that's really useful because then you don't have to worry about the timing of the reset relative to the clock and the clock registers. If the reset wasn't in the sensitivity list, then it means that this falling edge would be driven, registered through the design. Okay, generate bitstream. This would be, let me just finish, this would be synthesized and this, these signals would be driven according to the clock edge and the condition of the reset value. And that means that the reset will also be analyzed in the, in the timing analysis. The reset will also be analyzed with the timing analysis. So in Vivado, everything on the left hand side here goes down in order roughly of what you're going to do. So um, at the top, you can add sources and create block designs. And then after you've added your sources, you usually want to test them in simulation. And then after that stuff, you usually want to synthesize and implement and then generate your bit screen and open your hardware manager. So basically you slowly work your way down this left hand side until you get to open your hardware manager, which is what I'm going to be doing now. Open target, auto connect. So now I have my hardware manager open and we can see my board is here. Here is my, my second phone program device. It's going to automatically find the right place for me. So now it's programming it. And there's my LED flashing. Once a second. Here we go. My flashing LED. Very simple but I thought it would be a nice demonstration of the whole process from start to finish because, you know, it can be quite daunting getting these boards. I wanted to show the whole process from start to finish from getting a board, opening it up and what it all looks like. And there are a couple of places that people can get stuck. Definitely the drivers, getting programming the device, making sure that you have the device drivers working. That can really be as well something that people run into. It's really, really nice to see that Xilinx and Vivado have really got good Linux driver support now. So I can program my board in Linux, which is something that I wasn't able to get right with my RT board 10 years ago. All I mean, the parameter link thing that I ran into, that was also uh, interesting, that parameter length issue. Uh, if you didn't know about that, if you didn't know that parameter lengths are generally 32 bits, that would also be a problem area for you, perhaps. So uh, those kinds of things. And this is where Verilog or System Verilog can be slightly less forgiving than VHDL. VHDL will complain. VHDL will, instead of what Verilog did there or System Verilog, was it just chopped off the MSPs and carried on and gave me weird values. And in VHDL, you wouldn't have had that problem. VHDL would have complained. It wouldn't have just thrown away values like that. And I think that that is also something that you need to remember. Verilog is especially is, is pretty lenient to, the, to its detriment as far as letting you get away with things that you shouldn't be able to get away with. I will put this project on GitHub for people to take a look at and try if you would like to. And that's it. Thank you very much for watching my video. I hope that it can be helpful to you. And I plan on making some more of these little videos to kind of demonstrate things that can be done. Relatively simple things. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.